says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. From Newport, Tennessee, located in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains, this is the Radio Bible Hour telecast, featuring a message from God's Word by our speaker, Evangelist J. Harold Smith. Aren't you glad that we can come to Jesus with our burdens? And it's a joy to come with him with our praise also, and praise the Lord and his goodness. And this is a high hour. We appreciate God permitting us to have Dr. J. Harold Smith. He's been a friend to this church through the years, and we've dearly appreciated his ministry. He's preached more times than any living man in any part of history, over 68,000 times. This man has preached the Word of God. We're glad he's here to preach this morning. And uh, 90 years old, and I thank God for his willingness to come and be with us this morning. Dr. J. Harold Smith, God's great servant, comes now. And I wonder as he comes, if you wouldn't want to stand and honor this man by standing this morning for what he's done for God. God bless you. God can do what he wants to do with who he wants to do if they're a yielded servant. And this dear man has been the great man for God in this century. Brother Harold, we love you. You at home. All right. Our Father, thank you for the dear man of God, Dr. J. Harold Smith. And I pray this morning that you'll bless him to do just exactly what you want him to do and give him the added strength that he needs at this hour. Thank you for his friends and for everyone that's here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Doc. I love you. Pastor and Ms. Betters, members of the Fairview Baptist Church, all you that are visiting with us today, I want you to know I count this a real honor on your 82nd homecoming to be invited as your speaker. I'm with my favorite preacher. I'm in my favorite church. I'm in my favorite state. I'm in my favorite county, and I'm in my favorite place with the Lord. God is so good to me. I do not have words to express the gratitude of my heart for all that the Lord has done for us, especially in the last three years. I have learned more about the grace of God and about the sustaining grace of God in the last three years than I learned in the 65 years before this, these last three. I have learned that God can take care of us in our deepest sorrow. I found that to be true. I have missed Murtis more than words can tell. I met her when I was 11 and she was 11. I never had but one sweetheart in all of my life. I just love one woman, just one.
God gave me a love when he saved me for all men, all ladies, for the whole human race. I could not wish that any man or any woman would go to hell. I pray every day for the whole world. There are a number of you Brother Matters, there isn't a day in that letter that I write every morning to the left of the Lord. It's a two-page legal uh, pad that I write on, and I write every day, seven days a week, a letter to the Lord, like I'd write to my wife or to you. Brother Matters, I can't ever remember you leaving you and your wife out of that letter. Earl, I can't ever remember leaving you and Ruby out of that letter. Don, I can't ever remember leaving you and your wife, Joel, and a number of you other men and women in this church. I guess I write more names out of this church than any other church, maybe with one exception. And I love Fairview Baptist Church. My wife and I considered joining this church at one time when I was a full-time evangelist. I love your pastor. I believe in him. I love his choir. I love to hear Brother Earl sing such a movie play in the organist. I get a blessing out of it. And I'm honored to be here today. I've looked forward to it. I uh, was sitting there on that platform, looking out at this crowd, this gathering coming in. And I just thought how I'd like to be right here this morning when the trump would sound. The voice of the archangel would ring out. All those sweet, wonderful people that I've known that are right across the street, their bodies would come out. Then we that are alive and remain would be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. And I just wonder how many of you would be left sitting on that seat if the Lord and that trump were to sound. And I'm wondering how many of us would go up, would go up with shame instead of a shout. And I just thought, brother, I tell you, as I was sitting here on this platform, God is my witness. I just thought, as I was sitting there on that platform, Lord, I sure would like to be caught out with this crowd. If the Lord were to come, I can't imagine anybody in the world that I'd rather be found with than right here at Fairview this morning in this crowd. Turn your Bibles to, to Luke chapter 8 and verse 39. Luke chapter 8 and verse 39. Return to thine own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Now turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15 and verse 18. Luke chapter 15 and verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. The book of Luke Tell us about two wonderful, marvelous homecomings. This was the, this, this is the 82nd homecoming of this church. I was eight years old when they had their first homecoming. In this first story, in this first verse that I read, it represents a man, a husband. 
a father. A man that had a house. A man that had a home. And a man that had wrecked his home. Had wrecked his family. Had ruined his reputation. And possessed with a legion. A legion of devils. They were not able, nobody was able to tame him. Nobody was able to chain him. Nobody was able to put him in jail and keep him. For some reason, all of those devils gave him a power and gave him a supernatural power that made him uncontrollable. But one day, he met Jesus. And our wonderful and marvelous Lord Delivered him from all of those devils. Can you imagine him? The Bible says that after the Lord Jesus Christ had delivered him from all of those devils. He was sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Clothed and in his right mind. Up until that time he was naked. Until that time he wore no clothes. Until that time he took stones and cut himself. Until he was a bloody mass, a bloody mass. All over his head were wounds where he had cut himself. And his face were wounds and on his chest were wounds where he had cut himself. And he was a vicious, wild brute of a man. And when he came to Jesus, or when Jesus came to where he was, the Bible says that that man came saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Lord Jesus Christ cast out all of those devils. And they asked for permission to go into a herd of swine. And the Bible says that the Lord gave them permission. And they went into that herd of swine. And that man had so many devils in him, until he drove 2,000 hogs to suicide. Isn't that something? And when he said, Lord, I want to go with you and be one of your disciples. The Lord said, no, sir, I want you to go home. I want you to have a homecoming. Can you imagine, Brother, Brother Earl, that homecoming? Can you imagine, Brother, that wife that had been beaten and abused and hated and despised and many times beaten perhaps in an uh, inch of her life. Can you imagine? Now a man coming that's going to love her. And be kind and gentle to her. Can you imagine little children that were afraid of this man. And ran from him and hid from him. Now sitting on his lap. What a homecoming. What a marvelous homecoming for that man. The second verse that I read from Luke chapter 15. And verse 18 describes a young man. A young man that had left home, went away and had spent all of his living in riotous living. And his brother accused him of spending it with harlots. And he did not deny it. So evidently, he was immoral all of those days that he went away and from his home. But one day, I tell you, all of his money was gone. All of his friends were gone. All of his help was gone. And that young man sought employment. A young Jew. Can you imagine a Jew, brother, I tell you, seeking employment from a Gentile hog herder? A bootlegger. A bootlegger of pork. And the Bible says that he found a job of feeding swine. And he was so hungry until he would have filled his belly with a husk or with a slop that the hogs ate. He was so hungry. But down there in that hog pen, brother, those pens begin to smell and those hogs begin to squeal. And brother, he began to think. He began to think of his father, about his home. And he had and made a homecoming. What a glorious homecoming that was. He was welcomed by his father. And the Bible says that God's, that father represented God. Put on him a new robe. Put on him new shoes. Killed the fatted calf. Put upon him a ring. And welcomed him home and made a party for him. And everybody rejoiced but his brother, his elder brother. There are always those, brother, I tell you, that are on the outside that never come in and enjoy the homecomings. Brother Pastor, I have searched the word of God as diligently as I know how. And I do not find 
that Adam and Eve ever had a homecoming. In that beautiful, wonderful Garden of Eden, where there was no trace of illness or sin or crime, Satan somehow or another got through the gate and got into where Eve was and tempted her. And the Bible says that she yielded to his temptation and then got her husband, Adam, to yield that temptation. When God came, he drove them out of the garden and put an angel at the gate, mother, with a flaming sword so that they could never, never, never have a homecoming. Nowhere in the Bible can I find where, where, where Abraham ever went back to the Ur of Chaldeas. He never had a homecoming. But I do find in the Bible a man, a man that left home under a cloud, a man that had robbed his brother Esau and taken away from him all of his livelihood, stole from him his birthright, lied but then got the special blessing of the eldest son poured upon him. And now he leaves home and he goes away for 20 years. And now he's on his way for a homecoming. And I tell you, it's everything but a joyous occasion. He's scared within an inch of his life. And trembling, he divides his family and divides all of his cattle up into groups. And he sends a group ahead of him. Sheep, camels, horses, and servants. And they meet Esau, and Esau says, Whence cometh this band? Whence cometh all of this? And they said, For my master Jacob, he has sent an offering to you, a peace offering. And a second group arrives. And then, brother, I tell you, Esau has a homecoming. And guess what? The brother that he had stolen his birthright, the brother that he had robbed and cheated and lied to put his arms around him and kissed him. I love to go to homecoming. I like to go to family reunions. You know the best part of it? I tell you, it's not the good food like Sister Ruby cooks and like some of these other ladies here in this church cook. But it's the kissing, the kissing part. Oh, I see, brother, I tell you, husbands and wives and fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and cousins, even way down to the third and the second, uh, the third and the fourth cousins, I see them hugging one another and kissing one another at the homecoming. At the homecoming, we remember many, many things. And as we gather here today at this homecoming, I remember, and you will remember, many things. This church that has stood out here in this peach grove for all of these many years has stood for something. They have had pastors that stand for something. And their pastors, brother, I tell you, have been fearless. Their pastors, I tell you, have been faithful. Their pastors have been fruitful. Their pastors have been godly men. Their pastors have been clean and trustworthy. And the community respected them. Not only did the community respect them, but the church trusted them. You have had preachers that you trusted. You could trust them. You have preachers, brother, I tell you, that have been blessed by Christ. Fairview Baptist Church is a church that has been used of God to warn, number one, sinners of their doom and fate. From this platform and from the former pulpit stands of the pastor's brother of Fairview Baptist Church, there has gone forth a warning, a warning to sinners. Repent and turn to God. Our parish. There has never gone, brother, I tell you, from this pulpit, 
a message or a messenger. But I tell you, there's never gone from this pulpit a, a message that says, do the best you can, and God will take care of the rest of it. No, I tell you, we have all preached, every preacher that's ever preached, that the grace of God is sufficient, brother, to offer to you the mercy of God. And if that mercy and grace is offered to you, and you reject it, then I tell you, you deserve and you're going to bring down upon your own head your own sin and iniquity and doom. But from this pulpit has gone out the warning. A warning like Abraham gave to Sodom. A warning like he gave to his nephew Lot. From this platform of the Fairview Baptist Church has gone out. To not only her membership but to the world a leadership of the saints leading God's saints into God's way. As Moses led the children of Israel, the preachers of this church have led the people of this church to cheer, to comfort, to convict, to condemn, to command, and to commend. They have commended the saints to God. This church has led out to pray like Elijah prayed. Elijah prayed for rain and it came. He prayed for it to stop and it stopped. He prayed for fire and the fire fell. He stood against the false prophets of that day and condemned them. I'm glad there's never gone out of pussyfooting Preacher from this church, I tell you, they said to the world, we believe that the Bible is full of error. We believe, but I tell you, that there is no power in the blood of Jesus to cleanse. That message has never gone forth. It never will. I'd rather see this church blown away with a tornado. I'd rather see it burned into ashes and not a thing left, brother, not even a songbook, than for this church to ever become liberal in a few days, just a few days. You're a wonderful pastor that has been here for 20 odd years. We'll be saying goodbye. He'll be walking out and away from this church. Maybe he'll come back occasionally to preach, but his ministry will be over. And the devil, the devil is gonna do his dead level best to deceive whoever you elect as the search committee to find somebody to take his place. The devil's going to do his devil best to ease in some way or another and say, we have had so much of this loud preaching, shouting, sin, and, and dropping the, the devil, brother, and fighting the devil. Let's get us a preacher that's a little more reasonable. Let us get us a preacher, brother, that's a little more suited for this generation, for our young people. I hope that will never happen. Find God's man and somewhere out there will be God's servant to take the place like Brother Metters took the place of God's man. So we need, and this church has had men, to stand for God like Daniel. I tell you, Daniel was unfearing. Daniel could not be bought. There was no way, brother, I tell you, they could get him to compromise and to offer any quarters for the devil. Don't ever ask any quarters and don't ever give any quarters to the devil. Stand for God. Deacon, stand for God. Sunday school teachers, stand for God. Members of this church, stand for God. You, I tell you, that are home, coming back home, that belong to other churches, pray that when Brother Metters leaves, that God's man will be called, who will take the place of this servant of the Lord. Then I tell you, we find that for Fairview Baptist Church is noted for the preaching of the gospel like Paul. Pleading to the true God, pleasing to the true God, 
praying to the good God, to the only God, prophesying concerning things to come, praying for men everywhere. That has a great, uh, that's what every great pastor will lead the people to do. And a great people will follow their great preacher if they too know the same God. Are you one of God's children? I do not believe that one of you would deny the fact that we are living in a sick society. Among all the cards and telephone calls that I received during the celebration of my 90th birthday was a beautiful card from the White House Signed, Bill and Hillary. My secretary opened the letter, brought it to my desk, and she said, look here, what you received. Why in the world do you think Bill and Hillary wrote you a birthday card? I said, they were so amazed that I could live for 90 years in the mess we are in until brother they had to write me a congratulation. I tell you, don't you, don't you agree with me that we are living in a sick society? I ask you, can you imagine anything any sicker than two men Half naked, walking brother down the street, loving and stopping and kissing one another in the mouth. Just one thing. There's two women doing the same thing. God never made us to love sexually another man are two women to love each other sexually. The Bible always says that it's an abomination. But when a man, brother, gets in love with another man or a woman gets in love with another woman, they'll give up their husband, they'll give up their own children, they'll give up everything that's decent, they'll give up everything, brother, I tell you, that's honorable, they'll give, every, they'll give up everything, brother, I tell you, and have absolutely no shame, no wonder God calls it an abomination. Are we sick? When a little six-year-old boy will walk in and shoot another little six-year-old girl? Are we sick? When two boys by that time will walk into their school and kill 13 people and wound 23 or 24 others? We're sick. We're in a sick society. I tell you, not only are we a sick society, but we are a weary and wicked world. We are a godless and guilty generation. We are a hungry and hateful humanity. We are a crude and cruel culture with rampaging, mobs attacking our police, wanton destruction of our private private property, a decay of morals, a loss of patriotic values, a shame and a shame of real religion. That's the hour and the day and the moment that we are having this homecoming. We're in a terrible condition and unless we repent I mean, unless we repent in sackcloth and in ashes, our doom is going to come. Never does a pig think he has it better than the first cold spell in November. He's had corn to eat that he couldn't eat. Boy, all he has to do is just get up and go over there and eat and then go back and lay down. And he says to the other pigs, we've never had it so good. 
And about that time, here comes his owner. And the big 18-wheeler backs up and loads them all in a big 18-wheeler and takes them to Swift Packing Company in Chicago. And they'll let out of that pen, but I tell you, and now that truck into a pen, and then it was through a little lane and up a little, uh, little winding way. And the next thing they know, but I tell you, something stuck them in the throat. And their blood is gushing out. And before they stop kicking, they're in a boiling water with all of their hair coming out. And I want to tell you, we've been loaded on the truck. Brother, we've been headed, brother, toward the devil's slaughterhouse. He's got the dagger ready. And I tell you, before we know it, but I tell you, we, before we wake up, and if we don't wake up, we're going to be in the hot water. And I tell you, the hair is going to come out. And our poverty is going to reach us. And we're going to have our little children with rings in their nose. I tell you, and they're going to be slaves and servants. You mark my word, I'm telling you the truth. The only hope is Jesus Christ. We need faithful churches and pastors that will call us back to God, that will preach Christ as the only answer to the mess that we are in. God bless Fairview Baptist Church. God bless every deacon, every Sunday school teacher, every church officer. God bless every church leader in Fairview Baptist Church. God bless every senior citizen. God bless every adult man and woman. God bless every young person. God bless every child. God bless the sweet little innocent babies that are over in the nursery. God bless Fairview on our 82nd and a homecoming. There are some that are missing today. They were in the last homecoming. They will be some next year, if you have it. They will be missing that are here today. But I tell you, all of us, one of these days, are going to be missing. We will not go back to any more homecomings. We're going to be at home with the Lord. Brother Meadows, I have often tried to sit and imagine the homecoming of Jesus after he came to this earth. Brother Earl, I do not know anything that thrills my heart anymore Amen. than when I hear Jesus Christ say, Father, I've finished it. I've finished what you taught me to do. And he bows his head, gives up the ghost, goes down to paradise, and for three days and three nights, he preaches. That's the longest sermon ever been preached. Three days and three nights in paradise preaching. Then he came out and for 40 days he walked among the saints of God showing himself to over 500 people. And then he walked out on Mount Olivet, and all of a sudden, he began to go up, up, up. And as those of disciples stood there looking up into the heavens, two men, two angels, appeared to them saying, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus that you have seen go away will come again in like manner as you have seen him go. And then it cuts off. 
but let's just go with him. Another second. And he's arriving at the Father's house. Every angel is standing at attention. All of the saints, Mother, I tell you, that he just led out of paradise, Mother, are with him shouting, Glory, glory, glory to God in the highest. I tell you, the mighty angels fall before him. And the wonderful one, the wonderful Savior, that it just so recently bled and died naked upon the cross. And the one brother that they buried in a barred tomb is now back home. And what a welcome, what a welcome they received. And the conqueror, the conqueror has come. And but I tell you, every devil, brother, every devil on the face of this earth and every devil in hell and all of the devils of the universe fell on their faces crying, defeated, defeated, defeated. We have lost the battle. We have lost the battle. I want to tell you, thank God for that homecoming of my wonderful Lord. Just sitting there now, waiting, looking over to the Lord, waiting for the Lord to say, okay, son, it's time to go again. Wouldn't it be wonderful? I'd hate, oh, how I'd hate, Brother Earl, to leave all those good roles that Sister Ruby has made back there in that dining room for the Antichrist <laughs> and for all of the devils that would be left here on this earth. But I'd be willing if the trump would sound. It's now about seven minutes till 12. If at 12 sharp, the trumpet sound, and we all go home. That's one homecoming don't miss. And the only way that you'll ever be invited to come, those that are back here today, Homecoming with former members of this church, most of them. And before you can get an invitation to that homecoming in the heavens, Larry, we've got to be a member of the family of God. I know, I know that I'm a child of the King. Do you know that? And before we can rise to meet him at that homecoming with a shout, we've got to be clean and separated from the world. Could you honestly welcome the Lord Jesus in the next five minutes? Or is there something in your life, some little something, you hate somebody, you owe somebody and won't pay them. You're angry with somebody. Might be your husband or your wife. Or you children might be angry with your parents or grandparents. What is that little thing in your life that would keep you from saying, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. May we pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to think for just a minute. Why did you come to this homecoming? Why did some of you drive miles to get here? Why? You didn't just come for the meal. I doubt if there's a person that's here today they came just thinking they'll have a wonderful meal. And I can enjoy that meal. But you wanted to see the people that you had not seen in a long time. 
You want to come back to where you have many fond remembrances. Maybe you were married here in this church. Maybe your dad's funeral was preached in this church, or your mother's. Or maybe your little child was, their, their funeral was held in this church. They may be buried out here in this cemetery. You have reasons, many reasons for coming. Why would you long for the appearing of Jesus? For many reasons, for many. But you that have some little pet sin in your heart, you don't want him to come. You'd be ashamed for him to come and find that sin in your heart. I wonder how many here say, Preacher, I know I'm saved. Nobody can ever make me doubt that. But I know, Brother Harold, I'm not ready for that great homecoming in the sky. I got some little things in my life that ought not to be there. Maybe it's my prayer life. Maybe it's studying of God's Word. Maybe it's attending the house of God. Maybe it's my tithe or my offering. But somewhere I'm missing. And Brother Harold, I, I would want the Lord to come and find that thing in my heart. Would you just manifest it by lifting your hand? Don't say a word. Don't, don't speak a word, but just raise your hand and take it down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many more just say, Preacher, I know that I'm right with God. I know I'm saved. But I'm not where I ought to be spiritually. Pray for me. Just lift up that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. How many more say, Preacher? God is my witness. God knows how I'm living. He knows I'm not real what I ought to be. He knows I don't have the family altar in my home. He knows I don't pray like I ought to pray. He knows I don't have the right attitude toward things that I ought to have. He knows it. Just slip up that hand if you want us to pray for you. Anybody else? Thank you. I see you. Thank you. I see you. That must be eight or ten. I believe there's many more. God cannot help you unless you want him to help you. Unless you recognize your need and confess it, God cannot help you. Is there anybody here in this house this morning that say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I'm a sinner. I'm not bragging about it, but Brother Harold, I'm lost. And if I were to die, I'd go to hell. And I don't want to go to hell, preacher. Pray for me. Do you have enough interest in your soul to just ask a preacher in this congregation to pray for you by raising your hand? You don't have to speak a word. Will you just lift your hand and say, preacher, pray for me. I'm not right with God. I'm a sinner. Just slip up that hand. Anybody? Anywhere? Any place? Are all of us children of God? If that trump were to sound before 12, would all of us go up? Would there not be a person left here in this auditorium? Are you thinking? Are you ready to meet God? If not, do you have enough interest in your soul just to lift your hand and by that say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm a sinner. Anybody? Last time I asked. All right, would everybody look up here at me? Without any singing, without any playing on the instruments. You know who you were that raised your hand and said, Preacher, I'm saved, but I am not what I ought to be spiritually. Could we just have a homecoming right now? And you would just get up out of that seat, come down to this altar, let's have a prayer with you, and you come back to the Father back to it and confess that sin and walk out of this room with nothing between your soul and the Savior. You have the courage to raise your hand. The devil didn't do that. That was the Holy Spirit. Now obey the Spirit. Get up out of that seat and come and stand. I don't want anybody to kneel. Just come and stand right here before me. Will you do it? Will you get up out of that seat and come? Thank you. Anybody else suggest get right up? You know who you are. All of you know, I don't have to point you out, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't point you out for no amount of money, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't betray your trust. But would you just get right up right now and just walk down here and say, Preacher, I'm in it. I want to come back. I want to be like the prodigal. I want to come home today. I want to come back. I want to leave this ground. I want to go away from here today with nothing between my soul 
if you've got something against somebody in your heart, or if there's some little sin that you know about, nobody else knows about it, and God knows about it, and then you're miserable, you're not happy. Come on, right now, anybody else? I think there must have been about ten hands that I saw go up. Here's two, four, six, eight, nine. Is there one other? Ten. Anybody else? I tell you, if you have any feeling in your heart that you ought to get up and come, you may be a visitor, you may be a former member, but if there is any feeling in your heart at all, any desire to come and stand here with these others, that's the Spirit of God. And if you refuse to do it, you'll have to go home saying, I rejected the voice and the call of the Lord. And if the Lord never called you again, if the Lord never called you again, and you die and face the Lord with that sin in your heart, I tell you, this will be a sad homecoming for you. Thank you, ma'am, for coming. I just feel like there's somebody else that ought to come. But you've been so patient, so considerate. No, I can't keep you any longer. I'm going to ask one more time. Is there anybody that feels any urging at all? Can all of you walk out that door and say, I didn't have any desire to go to that altar? If you can't say that, come, thank you. God bless both of you. God bless both of you. Preacher, a preacher knows when the burden is lifted. And he, he knows that people are still out there that ought to come when others don't know it. God bless you. Thank you, honey, for coming. All right, is that everybody? And all the rest of you leave, say, well, I did what God told me to do. I did. Here's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. I want you eighteen to look right up here at me. How many of you are members of Fairview? Raise your hand. How many of you are members of some other church? Raise your hand. One, two, three, three. They're not members. How many of you know beyond a shadow of a doubt? There's not a person up here, even this little girl right here, could tell me when you were born physically. I was born June the 14th, 1910. I was there. I don't remember anything about it. But on September the 4th, 1932, I was born into the family of God. I was there. I remember it. Anybody that's really saved, you may not remember the exact date, but I want to tell you what, you'll remember the place, and you'll remember what happened to you. If you just walk down the aisle of a church and join the church, if you just signed a little card and then got baptized, and that's all it was to it, I want to tell you, you are still lost. But if you had a real experience with God and your life changed, I mean, you didn't turn over a new leaf, your life changed. That was the new birth. How many of you will say, Preacher, I'm not sure. I'm not real sure that I've ever really been saved. I joined the church, I was baptized. But I was lost for 10 years in the church. How many of you say, Preacher, I, I doubt sometimes whether I'm really saved or not. And I'm tired of that. And I want to know, I want to know that I'm a child of God. You can go away from here today knowing, what is this? Uh, is this uh, June the 26th? 
uh, 26, what is it, 28? Well, an old man, 90 years old, lives about two days late all the time anyway. But how many of you say, preacher? I don't know for sure that I'm really a child of God. I really had the new birth. Would you raise your hand? Anybody in this room? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, would you three just step right out here? Just, was anybody in here? Come over here, honey. And you come, come up just a little closer and up here if you can. To me, you three, four. Anybody else? Now the rest of you stand there for a moment. And if any of you are impatient, if you have to go to work, you've been free to, free to go. This is so vitally important. Souls are in the balance. Honey, do you want to know before you leave this building that you're a child of God? Do you want to know that? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, you, you, you misunderstand. Yeah. Honey, do you want to know before you leave here that you are a child of God? All right. Would both of you, would you just come out around here, honey, and stand right here? Come and just come out of here. Our Heavenly Father, here are two precious, precious souls. Lord, I believe they meant what they say they mean. They want to know Jesus. Lord, you stand today ready to save them. All they've got to do is trust you. And may they write today, this day, this 28th day of June, 2000, Lord, help them to say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And forgive them of every sin that they've ever committed. Some they can remember, some they've forgotten, but forgive them. And may this day be the day when they will be born into the family of God in Jesus' name. Honey, right now, would you, the lady, say, Dear Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. And forgive me of all of my sins. Some of them I can remember. Some I've forgotten. Wash them all away with the blood of Jesus. And right now, I'll give up the devil. I'll open the door of my heart. And let Jesus come in. In Jesus' name, amen. We say, preacher, I will. All right, will you ever forget June the 28th? Will you ever forget Fairview Baptist Church? And this morning, when you were born into the family of God, are you God's child? Where do you go to church? Where? All right, will you let the preacher, preacher Meadows baptize you? All right, will you pray about it? If you were baptized and wasn't saved, you haven't had Christian baptism, have you? You see that? That's right. You were just a dry center and came out a wet center. Do you see that? That's right. So what will you talk to him about it? Honey, pray this prayer after me. Say, Dear Jesus, have mercy on me a sinner and forgive me of all of my sins. And I'll give up the devil. I'll open my heart. And on this 28th day of June 2000, I'll open the door of my heart. And let Jesus come in. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you do that, honey? You believe he's heard you? Will you ever forget this day? All right, you could tell me your birthday, couldn't you? All right, but will you ever forget your spiritual birthday? You remember June the 28th, 2000, at Fairview Baptist Church. Where do you go to church, honey? All right, will you talk to Brother Bill about this in your family? Thank you. Now, all of you, you're my brothers, you're my sisters in the Lord. Do you know what's in your heart? God knows. I want every one of you to bow your head, close your eyes, and not out loud, but I want every one of you right now just to tell God why you got up out of that seat and came to this altar. What was it? Something had to be in your heart that made you feel a need. What was it? Tell the Lord about it right now. If it was wrong, 
ask him to forgive you. If it was something you were failing to do, ask him to help you. Have you asked him? You say, yes, I have. Do you believe he's forgiven you? You say, yes, I do. Are you willing to walk away from this altar knowing that there is nothing between your soul and the Savior? Can you say, yes, preacher? That's true. If so, I want every one of you out loud with me to repeat after me this prayer. Nobody's screaming it, just in your natural voice. Say, dear Lord, thank you for hearing my prayer, for cleansing my heart, and help me to leave this altar completely satisfied that you are my Lord and that there's nothing between us. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you say, preacher, I can walk back to my seat knowing that the Lord's heard me and forgiven me? Raise your hand. If, if that's wonderful. You may return to your seats. Brother Matters, service is yours. If you would like to know more about this work, go to the web address on your screen. This is Don Smith, and again, I want to thank you for watching this video today. And may the Lord bless you in every area of your life.